Fox Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. A lot of people have dinged Arizona that, you know, uh, we're not friendly to women and we um, haven't elected a lot of women. Actually, not exactly true. 20 years after the Fab Five swept through Arizona in 1998, they became known as the Fab Five. If you remember back, it was four Republicans, Governor Hull, Secretary of State Betsy Bayless, Superintendent of Public Instruction Lisa Graham Keegan, State Treasurer was Carol Springer at the time, and an Attorney General by the name of Janet Napolitano. All five major offices swept by women that year. 20 years later, fast forward, and women had a heck of a November in the general election. And Democrats had a really good election here in Arizona, and we're joined by two of them today. First, Katie Hobbs, your new Secretary of State. Later in the program, Kathy Hoffman, the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Great to see you. You too, thanks. Last time you were on the program, it was you and Steve Gaynor, mm -hmm. your opponent, let me take you to election night. This is tape number one. Um, this is Steve Gaynor on election night. Watch what he said, and I want your reaction afterwards to what you were thinking at that moment. Go ahead. I've watched. I've traveled around the state. Our GOP has done a great job. It's a close race. We're going to push. We're going to wait. We're going to fight to the end, and hopefully when the race is called, we'll be victorious. Well, it wasn't exactly a victory speech, mm -hmm. but that night we're on the set, and I remember something coming from your campaign saying, hold the presses here. AP called it for yep. him, right? Mm -hmm. They said Gainer's the winner, and you guys were hold the presses because so many votes were outstanding. Right, and we knew that the bulk of those ballots were those late, early ballots, um, and those had been trending towards Democrats, and there was a huge number of ballots in a very close race. Um, so we knew it wasn't over. Let's talk about that for a minute because we've got this interesting dichotomy. Mm -hmm. we, we've gotten people to vote early. Yeah. Um, take a look at tape number six. These are some of the local ballot counting going on. We've gotten people to vote early, but now it's such a flood of people voting early, late early, yeah. that now we're almost a prisoner of our own success in this thing. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think my concern in this entire process is not that we have fast results. It's that we have accurate results. And do I think there's things we can do to modernize and speed up the process? Absolutely. And we should be looking at ways to do that. Uh, but May I suggest I, one? Sure. Okay, right now, as I understand it, by statute, they can only start counting the mail-in ballots a week before mm -hmm. the election. How about starting it two weeks or ten days before to well, try to get a jump? Yeah, I mean... The counting of those ballots is not the problem. The problem is the signatures that they have to verify on the ballots that come in after they start counting ballots. So they have to do that after the fact, after they've counted all those earlies that they've already verified, after they count the polling place ballots, um, then they start verifying the signatures, and that's what the delay is. So you don't verify the signature first? If, you're, if, I, if I get my ballot in the mail, I vote it that day, I turn around and mail it back. They're getting it almost a month ahead of time. They're verifying all of those signatures, and those are the first ballots they count. Okay. And the first results that we see posted. Right, right. But if you turn in your ballot, your mail-in ballot on election day, yes. you still have to sign the envelope, and those are the signatures they verify later. It's the late mm -hmm. early. Yes. Right? Yep. Late early ballots. Yep. Um, as Secretary of State, you'll take office in January. What is job one for you? I think job one is uh, doing a top to bottom assessment of the office and looking at all the areas that need improvement. So it's, elections is a big issue and there's a lot of things that we can address there, but it's the entire office. I haven't talked to a lot of people around the state who use any services of the Secretary of State's office that say they're working well. So we need to, really? yeah. So we need to really assess the areas that need to be fixed and put together a solid plan of how we can fix those and make sure that we're providing the services that we should be for the, the people of Arizona. Are we, are we backwards on equipment, updated, modernized equipment? Is this part of the problem? Well, I think there's a, a lot of different issues. I mean, the Secretary of State's office has a lot of divisions. The State Library and Archives has been really uh, devastated under the current uh, secretary's uh, administration and I would like to put forward a vision for the library and archives. We used to be a model for the country. Um, yeah. Some of the business services um, which Michelle Reagan ran on being making more efficient, they're actually less efficient. 
Uh, so we just need to make sure that they're working for folks. Um, your win over, over Gaynor, um, you're, this, this puts you as our lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. You are second in command. Mm -hmm. If Doug Ducey should leave office early, if anything should happen to him, how much was that part of your calculus about this job that, you know, you've got to be ready for that job as well? Absolutely. First of all, the Secretary of State's job is very important. It's the job I want, the job I ran for. Um, but the voters of Arizona, I think, are well aware that they're also electing a lieutenant governor because we've had that happen many times. I feel prepared to take that on. Uh, should it happen, I've spent the last eight years in the legislature really in the trenches on, on important issues facing our state. Uh, so I'm ready to start tackling those on day one should that happen. Now, you were concerned, and we'll show some of the video uh, of, the, of the problems at the polling, the polling lines, tape number three. This, this goes back, I think, to April. Well, this was actually, I think, just this, this election. Um, you were concerned about the polling lines and getting people in there in a timely fashion. We talk about vo counting the votes accurately and not worrying about, mm -hmm. you know, necessarily getting it done quickly. What about this? Certainly, this is a big problem. I mean, this, uh, what I ran on is making sure that people can vote. And when you are trying to exercise that very basic right of our democracy and you have to wait in line, uh, a lot of people can't do that. They might have to leave to go to work or whatever reason. This is unacceptable, and we need to fix it. One of, one of the things that is kind of a balancing act, and I think you hear Republicans talk about this a lot, mm -hmm. that in the effort to, get, uh, to, to make voting more accessible to more people, if you make it too easy, you run the risk mm -hmm. of people voting who shouldn't be voting. Sure. How much is that a concern? Uh, fraud. How much of it is a, is a problem? Right. I mean, fraud uh, should be a concern of every election official, making sure that we are um, not allowing that to happen. Um, the fact is that in the last eight years, there have been 22 cases of voter fraud prosecuted. So it's not a widespread issue. You're talking about here in Arizona? Here in Arizona. Um, these are folks who own property in Arizona and another state and, and try to vote in both states. All of those, all of the prosecuted cases, that's the issue. One of the things that was uh, discussed during this, and this, this centered around uh, Maricopa County Recorder Radio Infantes, these early voting centers, these emergency voting mm -hmm. centers, um, this is for people who can't vote on Election Day. Mm -hmm. They're opened up the weekend or so mm -hmm. before the election. Has that become too loosey-goosey, where people without real emergencies mm -hmm. are just going there? Um, so the, the use of these emergency voting centers is, is not new. It's happened across the state before. Uh, so I'm not sure why it's a current concern this year. Um, I, think, I think because Republicans lost several well, of these races. That's a, yeah. That's um, become you, an issue. You said that, not me. <laughs> uh, so, but um, I think that um, in, in reality, there's no reason, except for in statute, that we shouldn't be able to have early voting all the way up until Election Day. Statute says it closes at 5 o'clock the Friday before. But there's really no physical reason that we can't have it open all the way. Could you see going to a system where we were completely mail-in? Um, I would want to make sure that every voter can vote in a way that's meaningful to them. And there's a lot of folks out there who still like to go to the polls, and that's meaningful to them. And I want to make sure that we can honor that. Um, I want to make it easier for everybody to vote who's eligible. Right. And um, so if, if mail-in ballots, if all mail-in ballots is a way to do that, um, then, yeah, um, we certainly have to address the issues of those late ballots coming in and how we speed that up. How about bit. this issue that came up again of ballot harvesting? Mm -hmm. And that's not a term you like. No. <laughs> tell, me, tell me why that is such an issue and, and mm -hmm. how your office will deal with it. Well, uh, the legislature passed a, a law to make it a felony to do this um, ballot collection. Um, the it's fact the idea that somebody can kind of poison the well or, or, or yeah. kind of basically fill out somebody's ballot for them. Well, it's collecting other people's ballots and turning them in. Um, I think there are ways to address chain of custody if this is a practice. Um, I offered amendments to do that and that they weren't uh, listened to. Um, the fact is that every single kind of uh, fraud that was mentioned that could be associated with this practice, um, number one, was already a, a crime in statute. and there was no, these weren't being reported as things actually happening with the practice of collecting ballots. So mm -hmm. not, not a big issue, you don't think? Right, right. Okay. Um, the, the other couple of things, I wanted, to, I wanted to roll something. I was very curious mm -hmm. about this. Tape number five. You've got to help me with this. I thought this was a really curious thing mm -hmm. at ASU. Okay. They were handing out pizza uh -huh. to people in line. Is that legal? 
Can you? Can you? I, I thought you weren't supposed to get anything of value to vote. <laughs> I was watching um, this, thinking, well, nice gesture, but there were definitely operatives kind of running this to keep people in line in a precinct where they thought these are probably folks who are going to vote Democrat. Um, I don't know why that would be illegal. I mean, I, my, when my um, my brother and sister-in-law were waiting in the presidential preference two years ago. They ordered pizza, so maybe they someone, it. yeah. Some, I think there was an orga organized group mm -hmm. sending pizzas out to keep people in line, make sure they voted, make it as comfortable for them as possible. Well, I don't, why would we not want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd have some who would say, now you're enticing people to just hang around. You know, you're, you're giving them something to keep them around and keep them voting. But why would you want people not to stay in line if they're in line to vote? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Fair enough. Fair enough. People were asking. I thought I'd ask you. Okay. All right. Um, final thing. Um, Michelle Reagan. Mm -hmm. We'll roll tape number nine. Michelle Reagan, you worked with her. Mm -hmm. You know her. You like her. Yeah. Has she been helpful? Is there already a transition? Oh, this is Newsmaker mm -hmm. Saturday, Sunday back then. <laughs> what is your take on how well they're kind of welcoming you into mm -hmm. the fold to let you get on, on the ground, feet going, ready to roll? Yeah, I reached out to Secretary Reagan before the election, and she said um, she was uh, ready to help make whatever transition uh, be as successful as possible. I've talked to her since. We're meeting on Monday, um, and I don't know if you saw yesterday, but uh, her office sent out a congratulatory tweet, yes. and um, you know, we're um, put out there publicly that they want to help make it very successful. So um, I'm looking forward to working with her in this process, and I think um, it'll go smoothly. How are you feeling right now? Are you nervous? I, you know, I am. I'm really excited to get to work for the people of Arizona. Um, this is a big job. It's an important job. Um, I'm not uh, kidding myself that it's going to be an easy job. Um, I'm ready to get to work to do it. Katie Hobbs, congratulations. Thank you. I can't wait to have you back on the program. Thank you so much. And you will come back. Yeah, absolutely. We won't have to wait for an election. No. Good. <laughs> Katie Hobbs, your Secretary of State. Coming up in the next segment of the program, um, Kathy Hoffman, who is the superintendent, your new superintendent of public instruction, will take, uh, take over the reins in January. She is my next guest up on Ladies Night here on Newsmaker Saturday. Back in a moment. And welcome back on Newsmaker Saturday, a bit of a costume change. We uh, tape these on different days. We had, as you know, in the first segment, we had Katie Hobbs, Secretary of State-elect, um, and now Kathy Hoffman, Superintendent of Public Instruction. At the ripe old age of 32 years old, you decide to get involved in politics. You're a public school teacher. Thank you for being here. Thank you for and having me. And congratulations, by Thank the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. This, um, just talking to you before the program, this is not your default position to be a political animal. Am, am I right? That's correct. I am a career educator. I have worked my entire professional career in Arizona's public schools, first as a speech therapist, first as a preschool teacher, and then after receiving my master's degree, I became a speech therapist. What made you jump in? For me, the tipping point was watching the confirmation hearing of Betsy DeVos over a year and a half ago. Uh, listening to her, it was clear to me that she had not spent time in the classroom. As someone who's worked in special education, I heard that some issues that um, she didn't understand special education law, and for, that was a tipping point for me, even though I know she's not an, an Arizona elected official by any means. Uh, it made me more aware of the, the need for educators to run for office, to have an educator leading our schools and be that voice for public education. You, you, I know you went to school in Oregon. Um, you were raised where? In Portland, Oregon. You were raised in Portland. What is your assessment of the state of education in Arizona? Let's just talk K through 12 here. I feel strongly that we are at a pivotal moment in Arizona's public education. We have some amazing programs some of the most dedicated, hardworking teachers. We know that because they are amongst the lowest paid in the country, and yet they stay, many of them stay in our schools, working day in and day out, the blood, sweat, and tears to make sure that our children get the best education possible. But right now, we, do, we are faced with a teacher crisis. We have many teachers that leave within their first couple years of teaching. They have high workloads, high classroom sizes, and I look forward to working on these issues so that we can attract highly trained teachers 
answers to the profession. You have a six billion dollar budget that you disperse funds, but you can't really magically give teachers a raise. That's not in your wheelhouse. It's not part of what the superintendent of public instruction does. That's correct, but I'm already building relationships both with the governor and with legislators to talk about the need for more funding for our schools, especially when it comes to our teachers, because they they truly do need it, and I see it as what's best for our students and I, I strongly believe that when we treat our teachers well we are in fact treating our students I'm glad well. you mm -hmm. said that because uh, let, let's show the the red for ed uh, tape number three I felt sometimes that what was lost in the red for ed and you were part of the movement was what about the kids I it was a lot of talk about the teachers and their pay and I thought you know have we, are we losing sight of the kids? I understand that teaching is, is one and the same, but there's also, I, I don't know, I felt a little bit of a disconnect. Were you comfortable entirely with that message, or were you also, uh, even as a teacher, mm -hmm. concerned that the kids were getting lost in the discussion? One of my biggest concerns is right now, with the teacher shortage and with the current state of education in Arizona right now, is that we have a revolving door of teachers. We have a lot of schools with long-term subs or teachers that don't have the same level of expertise in our schools that in some cases are honestly just a warm body to make sure that kids have supervision, and that's terrifying. Do you think some of that is really found in lower income schools? It, it's all over. I, I see it even more frequently in rural schools where they yes. are having an extremely hard time attracting teachers. Retention's been hard in yes. the rural areas. Exactly. So what do you do? I mean, the governor's talked about, you know, you've trying to incentivize people with more money to, to go to these schools. That's, Better pay. So pay is a p one piece of it. Also looking at teacher workload, looking at the mental health of our teachers and making sure that they feel supported, providing them with great professional development opportunities so that they are equipped to be uh, great teachers. And then the last thing I'm looking at that hasn't had as much attention is the benefits of our teachers. What types of health care benefits, retirement benefits, can we make some more flexibility in those areas or what's going to attract teachers to the profession? This is a very mm -hmm. interesting point you just made because teachers even with the attempt to give them this 20 percent raise over three years you know your cost of health care mm -hmm. your benefits okay. your pension contribution this has all gone up right so are you really realizing these pay raises that you're getting or is it getting eaten up mm -hmm. by insurance cost and pension contribution that's exactly it. You just, you just hit it on the mark. So while we've had stagnant teacher pay over the past decade, the cost of health care has gone up. You're going and backwards. And so teachers truly feel that they can't afford the cost of living here in Arizona because they're, they're not, the, the, the pay raises are not covering the high cost of living yeah. and their health insurance or child care. I know a lot of teachers that when they have children that they feel with their salary, they can't afford the child care, so they decide to leave the teaching profession to look after their children. A couple of just overview things. Do you think we have too many administrators in the system? It's a good question. I, it's something I'm going to be looking more closely at. Um, I, well, the way I make a comparison sometimes about districts is we think about the University of Arizona and the Arizona State University mm -hmm. that both have very high administrative costs, but if you had asked them, do you think there's too many administrative costs or do you think we should uh, combine the two to save on administrative costs, people would be deeply offended because um, we have an identity with ASU and U of sure. A that are deeply held identities and and so I see the same thing with school districts where people feel very connected to their school district and and so I think we need to be thinking carefully when we make those types of decisions and also look to see can they share costs of mm -hmm. for example transportation or special education services from district to district. Transportation is a big one. It is. And I, I just I wonder in in the changing technology that we've got with driverless cars and all of this kind of stuff I wonder if some of these things will over time sort themselves out, we'll have other options. I hope so. There, We do have a significant shortage of bus drivers. I hear that from district to district. And part of the reason for that is also pay because, for example, Amazon is now paying their workers a minimum wage of $15 an hour. So someone can go work in a warehouse yep. at Amazon in Phoenix and make $15 an hour, but our bus drivers are still making minimum wage. And so a lot of people are making those types of choices. Let's, um, I wanted to, to play, this was uh, Diane Douglas, tape number five. This was, um, 
She, she was talking kind of about her vision, and, and you're, you're obviously going to go a different direction. I want to play this and have you just react to it. I hope people don't use it as an opportunity to rip things down. Let's use it as a discourse Audio. to make things in here. better. We need a revival in Arizona developed standards, not one-size-fits-all, hand-me-down standards. One thing you do agree with her on, I don't think you're crazy about AZ Merit. Um, some of this testing stuff, I, you're not nuts about it, are you? That's true. We, we should be letting our teachers teach. There should be accountability. We should be measuring student progress. But what is disturbing to me is placing so much weight on one test and then judging our schools on an A through F grading system based 80% of their grades is based on that one standardized test and it's a, it's a lot of testing it's a lot of preparation to get ready for the test. My kids go and through it every day yes. they're in public school and, and there's a lot of time spent on getting ready for a just test. Just for one test and yeah. so that is something we'll be looking at in depth. You said you, you met you're starting to build a relationship with the governor. That's right. Have you met you met him? We had a phone conversation last night, actually, and, wow. and we ended the conversation with, let's schedule a time to meet in person. Do you believe, and, and I, I have to say, I take him at his word, I, I know that there was a lot of animus during the Red for Ed thing initially. I really think he's trying to do the right thing. Am, am I wrong? Am I, I being bamboozled here? <laughs> I, I think he, he's, he cares about this, and maybe for different reasons. I sincerely believe that we are going to be working together to find areas in which we can continue to improve our public schools. I think that's one thing that he feels is very important, an important piece of his legacy is to make sure that public schools are strong and that we're taking care of our kids. And I feel strongly that we can, we can take the 20 by 20 plan and keep improving it, keep expanding it to make sure that all of our teachers, all of our educators, including our support staff, such as our counselors or speech therapists or school psychologists, that everyone's included in, in receiving those pay increases. You're a Democrat. The Republicans are in love with charter schools. Are you? There are many great charter schools in Arizona. I have been traveling and touring them. We definitely, I, the governor and I actually agree that we need charter school reforms. What, you know, we're seeing some examples pop up, like the Primavera School, where we're seeing um, the CEO profiting millions upon yes. millions of dollars. Abuse. With Lack uh, of accountability. High, yes, and a high dropout rate of those students. And so we're not seeing the student success or even adequate teacher pay in those situations. Do you think charters thrive at the peril of the traditional public district schools? I don't quite see it that way. I don't think it's so mutually exclusive, especially when there is such a wide range of different types of charter schools. Some are for-profit, some are non-profit, some are chains of different, uh, a larger even national companies where they have charter schools in different states, and then there's also one school charter schools. Final thing, um, what would you want people in Arizona to know about you? Because you're really new to the scene, even though many <laughs> millions voted for you. I want them to know that I'm gonna be a voice for public education, whether it's traditional district school or charter schools. I will be out there advocating elevating the voices of our students and teachers. I've worked with some of our most vulnerable and marginalized kids in special education, as well as kids who speak different languages at home. And so I'm truly coming from the heart when I'm leading and thinking about these issues and, and looking at these issues in a more holistic mm -hmm. sense of how can, we, how can we serve our families. Kathy Hoffman, great to see you. Congratulations. Thank you. I really Best it. of luck. Thank I have you. I have great admiration for people who jump from the sideline and into the public arena, and uh, and we appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Back on Newsmaker Saturday in a minute. Thank you. It's great stuff. A program note, I hope you join us next week on Newsmaker Saturday, an amazing story of perseverance and survival. John Waddell stuck in the bottom of this abandoned gold mine. For four days, his amazing story of survival. I heard the rigging snap, and going down, I just grabbed hold of my safety rope as hard as I could. It was dark, uh, the ground was wet, it was cold, and from the trauma of breaking bones and the cold in the floor, I just shook, uncontrollably shaking. And we go back to the mind that almost killed him. John Waddell, my guest next week on Newsmaker Saturday. Thanks to Kathy Hoffman and Katie Hobbs, and appreciate you tuning in to Newsmaker Saturday. We'll see you next week.